G'day Ziggy D here and welcome to the 2.0 updated build guide to the Southpaw Reeve Ranger. This build is a super fast, high DPS and very fun dual wield sword Reeve build. In patch 1.3 this was a fairly solid character but in 2.0 The Awakening it is something else. This build was hugely buffed in clear speed and playability with the changes to Reeve and it also received huge damage buffs with the addition of several new unique one-handers that it can take advantage of on top of the new frenzy buffs. This build was intended to be enjoyed in non-hardcore leagues. It would be possible to adapt it to hardcore, but it really shines when you can suffer the occasional death to fully enjoy and appreciate its high damage and clear speed. The Southpaw Reeve Ranger is named for the unique way in which it takes advantage of the dual wield and Reeve mechanics. It holds either a mace or axe in its main hand while only using a sword in its offhand or Southpaw. This happens because Reeve only works with swords, daggers and claws. As such, if you wield a sword alongside either a mace or an axe, then Reeve will only use the sword. There are several advantages to this. Dual wielding gives you an inherent attack speed, damage and block bonus. So just putting on a white mace or axe in your other hand will boost your DPS overall. Secondly, because Reeve won't use the lower DPS mace or axe, you only need one high DPS weapons. Where with most dual wield builds you'll need two equally good weapons. When you have limited resources, you either spend your money buying one really good weapon or two okay ones. As such, this build is fairly cheap to start out. My first main hand was a Bright Beak that I purchased for only one Alchemy Orb at the time. However, despite being quite cheap to start out, this build has excellent scalability with plenty of options for really powerful endgame uniques and items. The third advantage to this dual wielding shenanigans is that you get to allocate some very efficient and powerful dual wield passives like Twin Terrors and Amber Dexterity. And the last but certainly not the least of the advantages to the Southpaw style is you get to take advantage of some nice bonuses on unique weapons, even if they are lower DPS since you don't actually attack with them. In 1.3 there was pretty much only one weapon that Southpaw really had access to, and that was the Bright Beak Unique Mace. This weapon is fairly budget and gives a nice chunk of elemental resistances, so it's essentially a fancy shield. When starting out your Southpaw Reeve Ranger, you can begin with this or really any axe or mace with some resistances on it. Now in patch 2.0, we have three new weapons that are far stronger to Southpaw with than the simple Bright Beak. The first of these choices is Relentless Fury, which is a solid choice for leveling in early endgame. This mace gives us Culling Strike, which instantly kills any enemy that we hit that has less than 10% life. As an added bonus, it gives us Onslaught when we cull an enemy, which is an attack and move speed buff that lasts for 3 seconds. As you clear packs, this will be up pretty much all of the time. An alternative option is Lavianja's Wisdom. This low level mace can be used right from level 20 all the way into endgame. Lavianja's is really good for Reeve with a bonus to area of effect and area damage. As an added bonus, it also has a little bit of life on it as well. The reduced movement speed penalty barely affects us as we're mostly whirling blades around for mobility anyway. This is my favourite budget weapon for any dual wield Reeve build right now. Both Relentless Fury and Lavianja's Wisdom are pretty low level common uniques so they should be fairly cheap and easy to obtain. However, once you are at endgame and have obtained a bit more wealth, you could go for something with a far greater impact, Death's Hand. This weapon gives us a power charge when we stun an enemy, which keeps our crit chance buffed up. And then, most importantly, it gives us Unholy Might on Critical Strike. It's quite easy to get over 50% crit chance on this build, and with the insane attack speed that we reach, we crit multiple times per second. So we basically always have the Unholy Might buff up on our character. Unholy Might is an exceptionally strong buff that gives us 30% of our physical damage as added Chaos damage. Chaos cannot be reflected back to our character and is resisted by very few mobs in the game, so it's an extremely safe and potent damage buff. Having it up constantly is a huge buff to this character. Our main skill in this build, Reeve, is supported by multi-strike and faster attacks for a huge attack speed boost. This allows us to build up and maintain Reeve stacks easily, as well as leveraging our many physical damage bonuses. Melee physical damage is used to multiply our base physical damage. The setup simply linked in a 4 linked item is very efficient and can reach very high damage totals. On my character with this combination on a 4 link, I can reach over 100k DPS on Reeve. For my 5th link, I currently use increased area of effect to boost my overall clear speed. You could swap this out for another damage support like Fizz to Lightning, Crit Supports or Hypothermia, but when you already have fairly high DPS, you gain more overall benefit from hitting the entire screen at once. Of course, no Reeve build is complete without Val Reeve, and we use Val Reeve supported by Multi Strike, Faster Attacks, and Fortify. This allows us to quickly reach the maximum 8 stacks of Reeve, as well as providing a short defensive buff. Now that Reeve no longer loses its stacks when you use another skill in 2.0, it's extremely easy to maintain the 8 stacks of Val Reeve almost indefinitely by using Whirling Blades to quickly traverse the map. Whirling Blades is supported by Blood Magic and Faster Attacks, so that it can be spammed endlessly for mobility to avoid enemy attacks, position for Reeves, and quickly jump from pack to pack. 
In a build with such high attack speed, Whirling Blades is the fastest mobility skill in Path of Exile. For other supporting skills, we have Warlord's Mark and Blood Rage linked to cast some damage taken. Blood Rage is merely linked for convenience, while Warlord's Mark provides Life Leech essential to mitigating reflected damage and for healing up after taking damage from enemies. Warlord's Mark is auto-cast on any reflect monster when we attack them due to the damage taken. Blood Rage provides us with easy and consistent Frenzy Charges, which are a massive damage boost. This build aims for at least 7 Frenzy Charges, with all 3 from the Passive Tree and Cratons from Merciless. I'm only running 6 at the moment, as this is an older character that I have not yet respect the charge over. Blood Rage also gives a big Life Leech boost, which helps against Reflect and with general survivability. We run Hatred as our 50% aura for damage scaling and also to provide powerful chills and freezes to our enemies. It also combos nicely with our Herald of Ice setup, which is linked to Curse on Hit and Assassin's Mark. Herald of Ice adds more cold damage, but most importantly, it causes an icy explosion whenever we kill a frozen monster, which is nearly every kill. Because of Curse on Hit, this explosion applies Assassin's Mark to nearby enemies. You won't see this in action very much because it happens almost instantly as you kill packs. You will, however, notice Assassin's Mark feeding you power charges, as well as providing life on kill. It also makes any enemies who don't instantly die more susceptible to critical strikes, allowing you to quickly finish them off. You'll likely have noticed how this build has two different curse setups, and yet it's not a dual curse build. This is because the curses almost never get in each other's way. Warlord's Mark is automatically used when we're in danger, while Assassin's Mark is only used when we're already killing enemies. Other useful skills are Enduring Cry to build up endurance charges for packs of dangerous physical monsters. We can also use an increased duration in Mortal Call to consume those charges and become fully immune to physical damage for a short duration. This can buy you a few seconds of safety needed to engage a particularly dangerous pack like Knitted Horrors. Ice Golem is used to provide bonus crit chance and accuracy. Even though he's unsupported, because he's generally left pretty far behind as you clear, he rarely actually dies. And you can simply recast him when he does. So we've already covered the offhand weapons that this build can use, but now I'll go over some of the other notable unique gear options you have at your disposal. On my Southpaw Reaver, I'm currently using the unique Helmet Abyssus. This helmet is one of the most insane DPS increases you can get in one item, especially when compared to its fairly reasonable pricing. Abyssus gives a huge amount of added flat physical damage, which is heavily taken advantage of in this build, and then it gives the highest single crit multiplier in one go, with up to 150% available on the best roll. The drawback of Abyssus, and why it is fairly inexpensive, is that it makes you much more susceptible to fizz damage. The combination of a huge physical damage bonus, along with increased physical damage taken, makes you very vulnerable to dying to Fizz Reflect. There are ways to mitigate this, however. First is our automated Warlord's Mark. This goes a large way to ensuring our survival against most forms of Reflect. Endurance Charges and Immortal Call can also be used. This is effective, but you must play slowly to ensure that you recognize whenever Reflect is present. Much more effective and without any loss in clear speed are two other uniques, Taste of Hate and Lightning Coil. Both of these take incoming physical damage and convert them to elemental damage, which can be much more easily resisted. I'm using Taste of Hate and have run 20 or so maps critting massive packs of Thorn Flesh champions and have not died once to reflect with Taste of Hate combined with Castle Damage Taken, Warlord's Mark. Taste of Hate is expensive, but the survivability it gives combined with the massive bonus to damage is insanely good. The alternative just for survivability and a bit more of a budget option than Taste of Hate is to just use a Lightning Coil. You can run a 4-link Lightning Coil very cheaply while you save up for Taste of Hate. Lightning Coil is good enough to keep using if you get a 5- or 6-linked one, but there are quite a few other good options on the chess market as well. Carcass Jack is the highest DPS and clear speed boost with its AoE bonuses, but it's not a very defensive option. Here is Ire is another good option with a 10% bonus to attack and spell dodge. It also has very high evasion and a small bonus to cold damage. Alternatively, you can just use a decent evasion chest with high evasion, life and resistances. This is likely the cheapest option if you want a 5 or 6 link as well. In the glove slot, you have the option of using Malagaro's Virtuosity. These gloves give a big bonus to crit chance and crit multiplier. This might be a little bit of an overkill if you're already using Abyssus, but they are a very nice DPS boost. Once you hit level 68 with this build, you should pick up an Atsiri's Promise Flask as well. These are extremely cheap and give a nice bonus to damage, chaos resistance, and bonus life leech. Any other armor pieces you pick up should prioritize life, evasion, and resistances. The more of the optional uniques you choose to use in the build, the better your rare gear must be in order to make up for the missing life and resistances. For your belt, I recommend a rare rustic sash with life, resistances and weapon elemental damage. Rings and amulet should have life and resist, but also as much life leech as you can get as well. Bonus stats are fizz damage, accuracy or crit modifiers. Your main weapon should have as high physical damage as possible and crit chance is a priority. Crit multiplier and attack speed are secondary but a very nice boost. You have the option of regular one-handed swords or foils, and I recommend the latter if you have a choice because the slightly longer range they have coupled with their bonus crit multiplier. 
You can use either two or three life lasts with any combination of seething or bubbling, but make sure to have at least one staunching suffix to remove bleeds. I often run a quality Quicksilver with Curse Removal in place of the third life flask, as this gives 6 seconds of curse immunity. I'll swap this out for a Ruby, Topaz or Sapphire flask if I'm fighting in maps with added elemental damage or against nasty elemental damage bosses. Okay, I'll now give you guys a quick run through the passive tree, what nodes we get and why. Of course we get the attack speed from the start of Ranger going through the life and evasion. If you wanted to go a little more glass cannon, you could alternatively go through the attack speed and melee damage. Though I think the life evasion are pretty good nodes here, and it's some of the few evasion scaling nodes that we get. Next up we'll get Finesse and we'll go up and get Heart of Oak. This gives a decent amount of life, 4% for two nodes, as well as a bit of stun recovery. That alone makes it worth it, but the extra 1% life regen helps us support Blood Rage as well. Primal Spirit gives us some strength and intelligence for uh, for supporting skills, uh, and then more importantly, it gives us increased flask charges gained. With our high clear speed, and with using things like Taste of Hate and that series Promise, it, uh, it makes it makes us have very high uptime on these utility flasks, and you can keep them up most of the time as you're clearing quickly through packs. You'll notice down here that I also picked up Druidic Rite. This gives another 20% flask charges gained and 20% flask effect duration. These two clusters of nodes being so close together and so powerful combined together with things like Atsuri's Promise and Taste of Hate is absolutely insane and definitely worth picking up in this build. Next up we go through the dual wield nodes here, getting weapon artistry of course, down into herbalism which is also a very nice flask node. As you can see we have a lot of powerful flask scaling nodes and flasks are very uh, powerful in Path of Exile in general and with this sort of flask scaling and flask uptime uh, it gets very very nice for survivability and utility and even damage once you start using some of those other utility flasks. You'll also know that we've picked up the Spirit Void cluster here. This is a powerful Mana Leech and Mana Gain on Hit cluster. And this alone, these three points, is enough to entirely support our mana costs on this uh, build. Any fast attacking, uh, attack based build like this that hits many enemies very quickly uh, is going to be very much covered by Spirit Void. And this is because it's got a combination of uh, Mana Leech and Mana Gain on Hit, which makes it work pretty much well against everything. Against large packs of enemies, the high attack speed means that the Mana Gain on Hit is very efficient. And, you know, we're, we're spending 32 mana per, uh, per cost, and that's uh, very well covered by hitting, you know, like. 10 plus mobs with screen sized AoE uh, is covering the uh, good portion of the mana cost just with the mana gain on hit but the mana leech because we deal such high physical damage as well is also covering any remaining mana cost that we need to cover. We do of course grab the Brutal Blade and Slashing Comeback sections here. Slashing Comeback has some excellent accuracy on it which is a huge DPS boost late game when you're running high damage and high crit but you don't have very much accuracy. This is a very nice scaler and Brutal Blade is just high attack speed and damage so it works out very nicely as well. Now we do get Heartseeker as well later when we go crit. You can pick this up later in the game. And then we of course get the Frenzy Charge here. The other Frenzy Charge over here, and the other Frenzy Charge over here. We are getting all three of the Frenzy Charges for Blood Rage, so make sure you pick all of those up as soon as you start running Blood Rage, as soon as possible, basically. We do get Acrobatics, the Acrobatics Improvements, and all the way into Phase Acrobatics. I think the defensive buff of this, even though there's some nasty Fizz damage in the game, that uh, Acrobatics is less impactful with helping against, it's still overall a massive survivability boost. And since this is a character designed to be enjoyed in non-hardcore leagues, although you can take the occasional nasty death from uh, things that make it past your layers of acrobatics and uh, block and evasion, uh, this protects you from the majority of things that are going to kill you. So, you know, 99 times out of 100 or even 999 times out of 1000, you're not going to die with this setup. It's just the occasional thing that would get through on a hardcore character potentially when you're using things like Abyssus. Up in the shadow section we get all the nice crit, we get the nice one handed nodes here, life and an extra crit elemental damage scaling there as well. Blood Drinker gives us some leech as well as a very, it being a very nice, nice life cluster in general as well. Down on this side of the tree we get Twin Terrors, very very efficient crit scaling and this is uh, part of the reason for dual wielding, uh, nodes like this being so efficient uh, as well as the base damage increases and the ability to use some insanely good offhands like some of the ones that we have here. Of course, Thick Skin being right off the same point from Twin Terrors makes it worth picking up. The 4% life you can pick up later if you want more life, but uh, is, you know, by itself not a not the super efficient node. We do come back down here a little bit. It is a little bit of a stretch, but Fatal Blade is a huge amount of damage crit and uh, crit multiplier, so it's very well worth picking up. And you can pick up the crit multiplier here later as well. 
Over this side in Duelist, we can grab Golem's Blood for helping support Blood uh, Blood Rage. We also have Master of the Arena does the same thing as well, as well as giving a little bit of AoE boost to Reeve on top of that as well. In top of good damage and life from the uh, Duelist area, the Dual Wield nodes here, Dervish, uh, a very nice balanced area of the tree to be in. There are two easy jewel sockets to pick up in this build for two points each. It's not a super jewel heavy build, but you can certainly make use of them. There's this one here and this one over here for two points each. Now, for jewels, you're looking for things like this with physical damage, attack speed, area damage, uh, crit chance and crit multiplier, and any jewel wielding bonuses essentially. So here's one decent jewel that I picked up and here's another one as well that I crafted that I'll use once I pick up the other cluster. Things that I haven't filled out, I am 86, but you can certainly go a lot further than this and you can certainly uh, reprioritize different things on the tree in favor of other things. The things you can opt for are things like coming down through here and going into Amber Dexterity. Amber Dexterity further rewards the South Ball playstyle by giving a massive attack speed boost to your offhand, which in this case is our actual damage dealing weapon. Another very nice optional cluster is up here in the shadow area. This depth perception cluster here is accuracy and crit chance. Although it doesn't look quite as good because 10% crit chance per node doesn't seem that good. 8% accuracy well covers up the gap in crit chance there. And accuracy and crit chance work very nicely together if you're hitting more often. And then accuracy is actually factored into crit rolls as well. Uh, having high accuracy and high crit chance means that you're going to crit a lot more overall. So this is a very nice damage increase in the late game. To play this build, it's important to keep up a good pace. You want to be keeping your Val Reeve stacks up as often as possible, and the faster you kill, the faster you also get flask charges back as well. At the start of a map, you can remove your Cast and Damage Taken gem and cast Blood Rage manually before replacing it. You can then hunt down the first couple packs to charge up your Val Reeve before unleashing it on another pack. Once you've done this, you can use your high mobility from Whirling Blades to jump from pack to pack, trying to avoid backtracking through the map. I've had some success in further boosting my clear speed by replacing faster attacks on Val Reeve with Val Haste instead. It takes a little longer to charge up two Val skills, but since you can keep up your Val Reeve snacks anyway, it works out pretty nicely. The only map mods that I suggest avoiding on this character are Fizz Reflect and Temporal Chains. The former will get you killed unless you're running both Taste of Hate and Lightning Coil with a decent amount of leech, and the latter will reduce your clear speed too much, causing you to lose Val Reeve snacks. Everything else is pretty much fair game. I hope you guys enjoyed this detailed build guide and I hope you have fun Southport reefing yourself. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments section below. That's it for now, I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.